Hello, I'm I'm very late. <laughs> uh, I said I would start streaming around five, and then it became five thirty, and now it's six. Uh, unfortunately, just uh, work got in the way. Well, you know, had to finish my job, <laughs> but we're here now. Just organizing myself briefly. Ugh. What a mess. Executive dysfunction has kicked in pretty hard the last couple weeks, and I might have a coffee mug graveyard on my desk. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in that, though. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, give me just a minute, and then we'll get started. All right, let's get down to business. Turn the music way down. <laughs> so last time we left off, uh, we left off with Gourguet just about to make his first ever landing uh, in the Empire. And he had recently uh, been paired with his new drone companion, Flerim Saho who will be serving as sort of his, like, uh, I don't know, kind of like a diplomatic attaché. But who must unfortunately pretend to be a more archaic form of technology <clears throat> than it actually is. And let's get down to it. The module and the two frigates touched down at a huge shuttle port on the banks of a broad, muddy, much-bridged river, still some distance from the center of the city, but surrounded by medium-rise buildings and low geodesic domes. Gourguet walked out of the craft with Flair Imzaho in its fake antique guise, humming loudly and crackling with static at his side. He found himself standing on a huge square of synthetic grass which had been unrolled up to the rear of the module. Standing on the grass were perhaps 40 or 50 Azadians in various styles of uniform and clothing. Gourguet, who'd been trying hard to work out how to recognize the various sexes, reckoned they were mostly of the intermediate or apex sex, with only a smattering of males and females. Beyond them stood several lines of identically uniformed males carrying weapons. Behind them, another group played rather strident and brash-sounding music. The guys with the guns are just the honor guard, Flair Imzaho said through its disguise. Don't be alarmed. I'm not, Gorgay said. He knew this was how things were done in the Empire. Formally, 
with official welcoming parties composed of imperial bureaucrats, security guards, officials from the game organizations, associated wives and concubines, and people representing news agencies. One of the apices strode towards him. And this one is addressed as Sir in Aachic, Flair Imzaho whispered. What? Gorgay said. He could, hardly, bleh, he could hardly hear the machine's voice over the humming noise it was making. It was buzzing and crackling loud enough to all but drown out the sound of the ceremonial band, and the static the drone was producing made Gorgay's hair stick out on one side. I said, he's called Sir in Aachic, Flair Imzaho hissed over the hum. Don't touch him, but when he holds up one hand, you hold up two and say your bit. Remember, don't touch him. The apex stopped just in front of Gourguet, held up one hand, and said, Welcome to Grosnichek, Erar, in the Empire of Azad, Murat Gurgi. Gourguet controlled a grimace, held up both hands to show they were empty of weapons, the old books explained, and said, I am honored to set foot upon the holy ground of Ear." In careful Aachic. Great start, muttered the drone. The rest of the welcoming passed in something of a daze. Bourguet's head swam. He sweated under the heat of the bright binary overhead while he was outside. He was expected to inspect the honor guard, he knew, though quite what he was supposed to be looking for had never been explained. And the alien smells of the shuttleport buildings, once they passed inside, to the reception, made him feel more strongly than he'd expected that he really was somewhere quite foreign. He was introduced to lots of people, again, mostly apices, and sensed they were delighted to be addressed in what was apparently quite passable Aachic. Flair Imzaho told him to do and say certain things, and he heard himself mouth the correct words and felt himself perform the acceptable gestures, but his overall impression was of chaotic movement and noisy, unlistening people. Rather smelly people, too, though he was sure they thought the same of him. He also had an odd feeling that they were laughing at him somewhere behind their faces. Apart from the obvious physical differences, the Azadians all seemed very compact and hard and determined compared to culture people. More energetic and even, if he was going to be critical, neurotic. The apices were, anyway. From the little he saw of the males, they seemed somehow duller, less fraught, and more stolid, as well as being physically bulkier, while the females appeared to be quieter, somehow deeper, and more delicate looking. He wondered how he looked to them. He was aware he stared a little at the oddly alien architecture and confusing interiors, as well as at the people. But on the other hand, he found a lot of people, mostly apices, again, staring at him. On a couple of occasions, Flair Imzaho had to repeat what it had said to him before he realized it was talking to him. Its monotonous hum and crackling static, never far away from him that afternoon, seemed only to add to the air of dazed, dreamlike unreality. They served food and drink in his honor. Culture and Azadian biology was close enough for a few foods and several drinks to be mutually digestible, including alcohol. He drank all they gave him, but bypassed it. They sat in a long, low shuttleport building, simply styled outside but ostentatiously furnished inside, around a long table loaded with food and drink. Uniformed, mer bleh, sorry. <laughs> Uniformed males served them. He remembered not to speak to them. He found that most of the people he spoke to either talked too fast or painstakingly slowly, but struggled through several conversations, nevertheless. Many people asked why he had come alone, and after several misunderstandings, he stopped trying to explain that he was accompanied by the drone and simply said he liked traveling by himself. Some asked him how good he was at Azad. He replied, truthfully, he had no idea. The ship had never told him. He said he hoped he would be able to play well enough not to make his hosts regret they had invited him to take part. A few seemed impressed by this, but, Bourguet thought, only in the way that adults are impressed by a respectful child. 
One apex, sitting on his right and dressed in a tight, uncomfortable-looking uniform similar to those worn by the three officers who'd boarded the limiting factor, kept asking him about his journey and the ship he'd made it on. Gourguet stuck to the agreed story. The apex continually refilled Gourguet's ornate crystal goblet with wine. The Gourguet was obliged to drink on each occasion a toast was proposed. Bypassing the liquor to avoid getting drunk meant he had to go to the toilet rather often for a drink of water as much as to urinate. He knew this was a su bleh. he knew this was a subject of some delicacy with the Azadians, but he seemed to be using the correct form of words each time. Nobody looked shocked, and Fleur Imzaho seemed calm. Eventually, the apex on Gourguet's left, whose name was Lo Pequil Monanin Signor, and who was a liaison official with the Alien Affairs Bureau, asked Gourguet if he was ready to leave for his hotel. Gourguet said he thought that he was supposed to be staying on board the module. Pickwell began to talk rather fast, and seemed surprised when Flair Imsaho cut in, talking equally quickly. The resulting conversation went a little too rapidly for Gourguet to follow perfectly, but the drone eventually explained that a compromise had been reached. Gourguet would stay in the module, but the module would be parked on the roof of the hotel. Guards and security would be provided for his protection, and the catering services of the hotel, which was one of the very best, would be at his disposal. Gourguet thought this all sounded reasonable. He invited Pickwell to come along in the module to the hotel, and the Apex accepted gladly. Before you ask our friend what we're passing over now, Flair Imzaho said, hovering and buzzing at Gourguet's elbow, that's called a shantytown, and it's where the city draws its surplus unskilled labor from. Gourguet frowned at the bulkily disguised drone. Lo Pickwell was standing beside Gourguet on the rear ramp of the module, which had opened to make a sort of balcony. The city unrolled beneath them. I thought we weren't to use Moraine in front of these people, Gourguet said to the machine. Oh, we're safe enough here. This guy's bugged, but the module can neutralize that. Gourguet pointed at the shantytown. What's that? He asked Pickwell. That is where people who have left the countryside for the bright lights of the... Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. That is where people who have left the countryside for the bright lights of the big city often end up. Unfortunately, many of them are just loafers. Driven off the land, Flair Imzaho added in Moraine, by an ingeniously unfair property tax system and the opportunistic top-down reorganization of the agricultural production apparatus. Gourguet wondered if the drone's last phrase meant farms, but he turned to Pickwell and said, I see. What does your machine say? Pickwell inquired. It was quoting some poetry, Gourguet told the Apex, about a great and beautiful city. Ah, Pickwell nodded, a series of upward jerks of the head. Your people like poetry, do they? Gourguet paused, then said, Well, some do and some don't, you know. Pickwell nodded wisely. The wind above the city drifted in over the restraining field around the balcony and brought with it a vague smell of burning. Gourguet leaned on the haze of field and looked down at the huge city slipping by underneath. Pickwell seemed reluctant to come too near the edge of the balcony. Oh, I have some good news for you, Pakewill said with a smile, rolling both lips back. What's that? My office, Pakewill said seriously and slowly, has succeeded in obtaining permission for you to follow the progress of the main series games all the way to Ekronidal. Ah, where the last few games are played. Why, yes. It is the culmination of the full six-year grand cycle on the Fire Planet itself. I assure you, you are most privileged to be allowed to attend. Guest players are rarely granted such an honor. I see. I am indeed honored. I offer my sincere thanks to you and your office. When I return to my home, I shall tell my people that the Azadians are a most generous folk. You have made me feel very welcome. 
Thank you. I am in your debt. Pequel seemed satisfied with this. He nodded, smiled. Gorgay nodded too, though he thought the better of attempting the smile. Well? Well, what, Jernal Gurgay? Flarium Zaho said, its yellow-green fields extending from its tiny casing like the wings of some exotic insect. It laid a ceremonial robe on Gurgay's bed. They were in the module, which now rested on the roof garden of Groznicek's Grand Hotel. How did I do? You did very well. You didn't call the minister sir when I told you to, and you were a bit vague at times, but on the whole, you did all right. You haven't caused any catastrophic diplomatic incidents or grievously insulted anybody. I'd say that's not too bad for the first day. Would you turn round and face the reverser? I want to make sure this thing fits properly. Gurgay turned round and held out his arms as the drone smoothed the robe against his back. He looked at himself in the reverser field. It's too long, and it doesn't suit me, he said. You're right, but it's what you have to wear for the grand ball in the palace tonight. It'll do. I might take the hem up. The module tells me it's bugged, incidentally, so watch what you say once you're outside the module's fields. Bugged? Gorgay looked at the image of the drone in the reverser. Position monitor and mic. Don't worry, they do this to everybody. Stand still. Yes, I think that hem needs to come up. Turn round. Gorgay turned around. You like ordering me around, don't you, machine? He said to the tiny drone. And don't be silly. Right, try it on. Gorgay put the robe on. Looked at his image in the reverser. What's this blank patch on the shoulder for? That's where your insignia would go if you had one. Gurgay fingered the bare area on the heavily embroidered robe. Couldn't we have made one up? It looks a bit bare. I suppose we could, Blair Imzaho said, hugging at the robe to adjust it. You have to be careful doing that sort of thing, though. Our Azadi and friends are always rather nonplussed by our lack of a flag or a symbol, and the culture rep here, you'll meet him tonight if he remembers to turn up, thought it was a pity there was no culture anthem for bands to play when our people come here, so he whistled them the first song that came into his head, and they've been playing that at receptions and ceremonies for the last eight years. I thought I recognized one of the tunes they played, Gurgay admitted. The drone pushed his arms up and made some more adjustments. Yes, but the first song that came into the guy's head was Lick Me Out. Have you heard the lyrics? Ah ha ha, Gurgay grinned. That song. Yes, that could be awkward. Damn right. If they find out, they'll probably declare war. Usual contact snafu. Gurgay laughed. And I used to think contact was so organized and efficient. He shook his head. Nice to know something works, the drone muttered. Well, you've kept this whole empire secret seven decades. That's worked, too. More luck than skill, Claire Imzaho said. It floated round in front of him, inspecting the robe. Do you really want an insignia? We could rustle something up, if it'd make you feel happier. Oh, don't bother. Right. We'll use your full name when they announce you at the ball tonight. Sounds reasonably impressive. They can't grasp we don't have any real ranks either, so you may find they use Morat as a kind of title. The little drone dipped to fix a stray gold thread near the hem. It's all to the good in the end. They're a bit blind to the culture just because they can't comprehend it in their own hierarchical terms. They can't take us seriously. What a surprise. Hmm... I've got a feeling it's all part of a plan. Even this delinquent rep, Ambassador, sorry, is part of it. You too, I think. You think, Gurgay said. They've built you up, Gurgay, the drone told him, rising to head height and brushing his hair back a little. Gurgay, in turn, brushed the meddlesome field away from his brow. Contact has told the Empire you're one hotshot game player, 
They've said they reckon you can get to Colonel, Bishop, Junior, Ministerial level. What? Gurgay said, looking horrified. That's not what they told me. Or me, the drone said. I only found out myself looking at a news roundup an hour ago. They're setting you up, man. They want to keep the Empire happy, and they're using you to do it. First, they get them good and worried, telling them that you can beat some of their finest players. Then, when, as is probably going to happen, you get knocked out in the first round, they thereby reassure the Empire the culture is just a joke. We get things wrong. We're easily humiliated. Gourguet looked levelly at the drone, eyes narrowed. First round, you think, do you? He said calmly. Oh, I'm sorry. The little drone wavered back a little in the air, looking embarrassed. Are you offended? I was just assuming... Well, I've watched you play. I mean... The machine's voice trailed off. Gourguet removed the heavy robe and dropped it onto the floor. I think I'll take a bath, he told the drone. The machine hesitated, then picked up the robe and quickly left the cabin. Gourguet sat on the bed and rubbed his beard. In fact, the drone had not offended him. He had his own secrets. He was sure he could do better in the game than Contact expected. For the last hundred days on the limiting factor, he knew he hadn't been extending himself. While he hadn't been trying to lose or make any deliberate mistakes, he also had not been concentrating as much as he intended to in the, in the coming games. He wasn't sure himself why he was pulling his punches in this way, but somehow it seemed important not to let Contact know everything, to keep something back. It was a small victory against them, a little game, a gesture on a lesser board, a blow against the elements and the gods. <clears throat> the great palace of Groznicek lay by the broad and murky river which had given the city its name. That night, there was a grand ball for the more important people who would be playing the game of Azad over the next half year. They were taken there in a ground car, along broad, tree-lined boulevards lit by tall floodlights. Gurgay sat in the back of the vehicle with Pequil, who'd been in the car when it arrived at the hotel. A uniformed male drove the car, apparently in sole control of the machine. Gourguet tried not to think about crashes. Claire Imzaho sat on the floor in its bulky disguise, humming quietly and attracting small fibers from the limousine's furry floor covering. The palace wasn't as immense as Gourguet had expected, though still impressive enough. It was, ornately, it was ornately decorated and brightly illuminated, and from each of its many spires and towers, long, richly decorated banners waved sinuously, slow, brilliant waves of heraldry against the orange-black sky. In the awning-covered courtyard, where the car stopped, there was a huge array of gilded scaffolding on which burned 12,000 candles of various sizes and colors, one for every person entered in the games. The ball itself was for over a thousand people, about half of them game players. The rest were mostly partners of the players, or officials, priests, officers, and bureaucrats who were sufficiently content with their present position, and who had earned the security of tenure, which meant they could not be displaced, no matter how well their underlings might do in the games, not want to compete. I'm sorry. That sentence was confusing because the M-dash break was so long. <laughs> uh, without the M-dash, it reads, Bureaucrats who are sufficiently content with their present position not to want to compete. The mentors and administrators of the Azad Colleges, the game's teaching institutions, formed the remainder of the gathering, and were similarly exempt from the need to take part in the tournament. The night was too warm for Gurgay's taste. A thick heat filled, I'm sorry, yes, a thick heat filled with the city smell and stagnant. The robe was heavy and surprisingly uncomfortable. Gourguet wondered how soon he could politely leave the ball. They entered the palace through a huge doorway flanked by massive opened gates of polished, jewel-studded metal. The vestibules and halls they passed through glittered with sumptuous decorations standing on tables or hanging from walls and ceilings. 
The people were as fabulous as their surroundings. The females, of whom there seemed to be a great number, were ablaze with jewelry and extravagantly ornamented dresses. Gourguet guessed that, measuring from the bottom of their bell-shaped gowns, the women must have been as broad as they were tall. They rustled as they went by, and smelled strongly of heavy, obtrusive perfumes. Many of the people he passed glanced or looked or actually stopped and stared at Gourguet and the floating, humming, crackling Flair Imzaho. Every few meters along the walls, and on both sides of every doorway, gaudily uniformed males stood stock still, their trousered legs slightly apart, gloved hands clasped behind their rod-straight backs, their gaze fixed firmly on the high painted ceilings. What are they standing there for? Gourguet whispered to the drone in Aachic, low enough so that Pickwell couldn't hear. Show, the machine said. Gourguet thought about this. Show? Yes, to show that the Emperor is rich and important enough to have hundreds of flunkies standing around doing nothing. Doesn't everybody know that already? The drone didn't answer for a moment. Then it sighed. You haven't really cracked the psychology of wealth and power yet, have you, Jornal Gourguet? Gourguet walked on, smiling on the side of his face Flair Imzaho couldn't see. The apices they passed were all dressed in the same heavy robes Gourguet was wearing, ornate without being ostentatious. What struck Gourguet most strongly, though, was that the whole place and everybody in it seemed to be stuck in another age. He could see nothing in the palace or worn by the people that could not have been produced at least a thousand years earlier. He had watched recordings of ancient imperial ceremonies when he'd done his own research into the society and thought he had a reasonable grasp of ancient dress and forms. It struck him as strange that despite the Empire's obvious, if limited, technological sophistication, its formal side remained so entrenched in the past. Ancient customs, fashions, and architectural forms were all common in the culture too, but they were used freely, even haphazardly, as only parts of a whole range of styles, not adhered to rigidly and consistently to the exclusion of all else. Just wait here. You'll be announced, the drone said, tugging at Gurgay's sleeve so that he stopped beside the smiling Lopequil at a doorway leading down a huge flight of broad steps into the main ballroom. Pequil handed a card to a uniformed Apex standing at the top of the steps, whose amplified voice rang round the vast hall. The Honorable Lopequil Monanine, AAB, Level 2 Main, Empire Medal, Ored of Merit and Bar, with... Chark Gavant Shah Gurnau Morat Gurgi Dam Haziz. They walked down the grand staircase. The scene below them was an order of magnitude brighter and more impressive than any social event Gorgay had ever witnessed. The culture simply did not do things on such a scale. The ballroom looked like a vast and glittering pool into which somebody had thrown a thousand fabulous flowers and then stirred. That announcer murdered my name, Gurgay said to the drone. He glanced at Pickwell. But why does our friend look so unhappy? I think because the senior in his name was missed out, Claire Imzaho said. Is that important? Gurgay, in this society, everything is important, the drone said, then added glumly, at least you both got announced. Hello there, a voice shouted out as they got to the bottom of the stairs. A tall, male-looking person pushed between a couple of his audience to get beside Gourguet. He wore garish, flowing robes. He had a beard, bunt brown hair, bright, staring green eyes, and he looked as though he might come from the culture. He stuck one long-fingered, many-ringed hand out, took Gurgay's hand and clasped it. Chohobaham Za, pleased to meet you. I used to know your name too until that delinquent at the top of the stairs got his tongue round it. Gurgay, isn't it? Oh, Pequil, you here too, eh? 
He pushed a glass into Pequil's hands. Here, you drink this muck, don't you? Hi, drone. Hey, Gourguet. He put his arm round Gourguet's shoulders. You want a proper drink, yeah? Jernau Morat Gurgi, Pequil began, looking awkward. Let me introduce... But Shahobaham Zah was already steering Gurgay away through the crowds at the bottom of the staircase. How's things anyway, Pequil? He shouted over his shoulder at the dazed-looking apex. Okay? Yeah? Good. Talk to you later. Just taking this other exile for a little drink. A pale-looking Pequil waved back weakly. Fleer Emzaho hesitated, then stayed with the Azadian. Hang on, I gotta drink some water. <clears throat> Great. Jehovaham Zaw turned back to Gurgay, removed his arm from the other man's shoulders, and in a less strident voice said, Oh, boring bladder, old Pickwell. Hope you didn't mind being dragged away. I'll cope with the remorse, Gurgay said, looking the other culture man up and down. I take it you're the ambassador. The same, Zaw said, and belched. This way, he nodded, guiding Gurgay through the crowds. I spotted some griff bottles behind one of the drink tables, and I went to dock with a couple before the emp and his cronies snaffled the lot. They passed a low stage where a band played loudly, Crazy place, isn't it? Zaw shouted at Gurgay as they headed for the rear of the hall. Gurgay wondered exactly what the other man was referring to. Here we is, Zaw said, coming to a stop by a long line of tables. Behind the tables, liveried males served drinks and food to the guests. Above them, on a huge arched wall, a dark tapestry sewn with diamonds and gold thread depicted an ancient space battle. Zaw gave a whistle and leaned over to whisper to the tall, stern-looking male who approached. Gurgay saw a piece of paper being exchanged. Then Zaw slapped his hand over Gurgay's wrist and breezed away from the tables, hauling Gurgay over to a large circular couch set round the bottom of a fluted pillar of marble inlaid with precious metals. "'Wait till you taste this stuff,' Zaw said, leaning toward Gurgay and winking." Jehovaham Zaw was a little lighter in color than Gurgay, but still much darker than the average Azadian. It was notoriously difficult to judge the age of culture people, but Gurgay guessed the man was a decade or so younger than he. Uh, you do drink, Zaw said, looking suddenly alarmed. I've been bypassing the stuff, Gurgay told him. Zaw shook his head emphatically. Don't do that with Griff, he said, patting Gorgay's hand. Would be tragic. Ought to be a treasonable offense, in fact. Gland crystal fugue state instead. Brilliant combination. Blows your neurons out your ass. Griff is stunning stuff. Comes from a chronodol, you know. Shipped over for the games. Only make it during the oxygen season. Stuff we're getting should be two great years old. Costs a fortune. Open more legs than a cosmetic laser. Anyway... Zaw, said back, Zaw sat back, clasping his hands and looking seriously at Gurgay. What do you think of the Empire? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it? I mean, vicious, but sexy, right? He jumped forward as a male servant carrying a tray with a couple of small, stoppered jugs came up to them. Aha! He took the tray with his jugs in exchange for another scrap of paper. He unstoppered both jugs and handed one to Gurgay. He raised his jug to his lips, closed his eyes, and breathed deeply. He muttered something under his breath that sounded like a chant. Finally, he drank, keeping his eyes tightly closed. When he opened his eyes, Gurgay was sitting with one elbow on his knee, his chin in his hand, looking quizzically at him. Did they recruit you like this? he asked. Or is it an effect the Empire has? Zaw laughed throatily, gazing up to the ceiling, where a vast painting showed ancient sea ships fighting some millennia-old engagement. Both, Zaw said, still chuckling. He nodded at Gurgay's jug, an amused but, so it seemed to Gurgay, more intelligent look on his face now, a look which made Gurgay revise his estimation of the other man's age upward by several decades. You going to drink that stuff? Zaw said. 
I just spent an unskilled worker's yearly wage getting it for you. Bourguet looked into the other man's bright green eyes for a moment, then raised the jug to his lips. To the unskilled workers, Mr. Zaw, he said, and drank. Zaw laughed uproariously again, head back. I think we're going to get along just fine, game player Gourguet. The griff was sweet, scented, subtle, and smoky. Zaw drained his own jug, holding the thin spout over his opened mouth to savor the last few drops. He looked at Gourguet and smacked his lips. Slips down like liquid silk, he said. He put the jug on the floor. So, you're going to play the great game, eh, to now, Gourguet? That's what I'm here for. Gourguet sipped a little more of the heady liquor. Let me give you some advice, Za said, briefly touching his arm. Don't bet on anything. And watch the women, or men, or both, or whatever you're into. You could get into some very nasty situations if you aren't careful. Even if you mean to stay celibate, you might find some of them, women especially, just can't wait to see what's between your legs. And they take that sort of stuff ridiculously seriously. You want any body games? Tell me. I've got contacts. I can set it up nice and discreet. Utter discretion and complete secrecy totally guaranteed. Ask anybody. He laughed, then touched Gorgay's arm again and looked serious. I'm serious, he said. I can fix you up. I'll bear that in mind, Gorgay said, drinking. Thank you for the warning. My pleasure. No problem. I've been here eight, no, nine years now. Envoy before me only lasted twenty days, got chucked out for consorting with a minister's wife. Za shook his head and chuckled. I mean, I like her style, but shit, a minister. Crazy bitch was lucky she was only thrown out. If she'd been one of their own, she'd have been up her orifices with acid leeches before the prison gate had shut. Makes me cross my legs just thinking about it. Before Gurgay could reply, or Zaw could continue, there was a terrific crashing noise from the top of the great staircase, like the sound of thousands of breaking bottles. It echoed through the ballroom. Damn, the Emperor, Zaw said, standing. He nodded at Gurgay's jug. Drink up, man. Gurgay stood up slowly. He pushed the jug into Zaw's hands. You have it. I think you appreciate it more. Zaw restoppered the jug and shoved it into a fold in his robe. There was a lot of activity at the top of the stairs. People in the ballroom were milling about too, apparently forming a sort of human corridor which led from the bottom of the staircase to a large, glittering seat set on a low dais covered with gold cloth. Better get into your place, Zaw said. He went to grab Gurgay's wrist again, but Gurgay raised his hand suddenly, smoothing his beard. Zaw missed. Gurgay nodded forward. After you, he said. Zaw winked and strode off. They came up behind the group of people in front of the throne. Here's your boy, Pickwill, Zaw announced to the worried-looking Apex, then went to stand further away. Gurgay found himself standing beside Pickwill, with Flair Imzaho floating behind him at waist level, humming assiduously. Mr. Gurgi. We were starting to worry about you, Hickwell whispered, glancing nervously up at the staircase. Were you? Gurgay said. How comforting. Hickwell didn't look very pleased. Gurgay wondered if the apex had been addressed wrongly again. I have good news, Gurgi, Hickwell whispered. He looked up at Gurgay, who tried hard to look inquisitive. I have succeeded in obtaining for you a personal introduction to their royal highness the emperor regent nikasar i am greatly honored gurgay smiled indeed indeed a most singular and exceptional honor pakewell gulped so don't fuck it up flair imsaho muttered from behind gurgay looked at the machine the crashing noise sounded again and suddenly, sweeping down the staircase, quickly filling its breadth, a great gaudy wave of people flowed down toward the floor. Gurgay assumed the one in the lead, carrying a long staff, was the Emperor, 
or Emperor Regent, as Pakewell had called him. But at the bottom of the stairs, that apex stood aside and shouted, "'There, Imperial Highness of the College of Kansev, Prince of Space, Defender of the Faith, Duke of Grosnicek, Master of the Fires of Ekranadol, the Emperor Regent Nikasar I. The Emperor was dressed all in black, a medium-sized, serious-looking apex, quite unornamented. He was surrounded by fabulously dressed Azadians of all sexes, including comparatively conservatively uniformed male and apex guards toning big swords and small guns. Preceding the Emperor was a variety of large animals, four- and six-legged, variously colored, collared, and muzzled, and held on the end of an emerald and ruby-chained lead by a fat, almost naked male whose oiled skin glowed like frosted gold in the ballroom lights. The Emperor stopped and talked to some people, who knelt when he approached, further down the line on the far side. Then he crossed with his entourage to the side Gourguet was on. The ballroom was almost totally silent. Gourguet could hear the throaty breathing of several of the tamed carnivores. Pequel was sweating. A pulse beat quickly in the hollow of his cheek. Nikasar came closer. Gourguet thought that the Emperor looked, if anything, a little less impressively hard and determined than the average Azadian. He was slightly stooped, and even when he was talking to somebody only a couple of meters away, Gourguet could hear only the guest's side of the conversation. Nikosar looked a little younger than Gourguet had expected. Despite having been advised about his personal introduction by Pickwill, Gourguet nevertheless felt mildly surprised when the black-clothed apex stopped in front of him. Kneel! Fleur Imzaho hissed. Gourguet knelt on one knee. The silence seemed to deepen. Oh shit, the humming machine muttered. Pickwill moaned. The Emperor looked down at Gourguet, then gave a small smile. Sir Wanni, you must be our foreign guest. We wish you a good game. Gourguet realized what he'd done wrong and went down on the other knee too, but the Emperor gave a small wave with one ringed hand and said, No, no, we admire originality. You shall greet us on one knee in future. Thank you, your highness, Gourguet said with a small bow. The Emperor nodded and turned to walk further up the line. Pickwell gave a quivering sigh. The Emperor reached the throne on the dais, and music started. People suddenly started talking, and the twin lines of people broke up. Everybody chattered and gesticulated at once. Pickwell looked as though he was about to collapse. He seemed to be speechless. Flair Imzaho floated up to Gourguet. Please, it said, don't ever do something like that again. Gourguet ignored the machine. At least you could talk, eh? Pequel said suddenly, taking a glass from a tray with a shaking hand. At least he could talk, eh, machine? He was talking almost too fast for Gourguet to follow. He sank the drink. Most people freeze. I think I might have. Many people do. What does one knee matter, eh? What does that matter? Pequel looked round for the male with the drinks tray, then gazed at the throne where the Emperor was sitting talking to some of his retinue. What a majestic presence, Pequel said. Why is he Emperor Regent? Gurgay asked the sweating Apex. Their Royal Highness had to take up the royal chain after the Emperor Molsk sadly died two years ago. As second best player during the last games, our worship Nikasar was elevated to the throne, but I have no doubt they will remain there. Gourguet, who'd read about Molsk dying but hadn't realized Nikasar wasn't regarded as a full emperor in his own right, nodded and, looking at the extravagantly accoutred people and beasts surrounding the imperial dais, wondered what additional splendors Nikasar could possibly merit if he did win the games. Let me check ahead to see if we have a good stopping point um, coming soon, because if not, this would be the place. Mm. Gee, I don't know. Give me just a minute here.
Gotta do some quick math on time, because I'm supposed to head out to the fence shortly. Oh, uh, let's just go for it. <clears throat> I'd offer to dance with you, but they don't approve of men dancing together, Jehovah Ham Zah said, coming up to where Gurgay stood by a pillar. Zah took a plate of paper-wrapped sweetmeats from a small table and held it out to Gurgay, who shook his head. Zah popped a couple of the little pastries into his mouth while Gurgay watched the elaborate, patterned dances surge in eddies of flesh and colored cloth across the ballroom floor. Flair Imsaho floated nearby. There were some bits of paper sticking to its static-charged casing. Don't worry, Gurgay told Zaw. I shan't feel insulted. A good. Enjoying yourself? Zaw leaned against the pillar. Thought you looked a bit lonely standing here. Where's Pickwell? He's talking to some Imperial officials, trying to arrange a private audience. Oh, he'll be lucky, snorted Zaw. What do you think of our wonderful Emperor, anyway? He seems very imperious, Gurgay said, and made a frowning gesture at the robes he was wearing, and tapped one ear. Zaw looked amused, then mystified, then he laughed. Oh, the microphone. He shook his head, unwrapped another couple of pastries, and ate them. Don't worry about that. Just say what you want. You won't be assassinated or anything. They don't mind. Diplomatic protocol. We pretend the robes aren't bugged, and they pretend they haven't heard anything. It's a little game we play. If you say so, Gurgay said, looking over at the Imperial Dais. Not much to look at at the moment, young Nikasar, Zah said, following Gurgay's gaze. He gets his full regalia after the game. Theoretically, in mourning for Mulsk at the moment. A black's their color for mourning. Something to do with space, I think. He looked at the Emperor for a while. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Sorry, had to change the music back to what I'm allowed to play. <clears throat> he looked at the Emperor for a while. Odd setup, don't you think? All that power belonging to one person. Seems a rather, mm, potentially unstable way to run a society, Gurgay agreed. Hmm, of course, it's all relative, isn't it? Really, you know, that old guy the Emp's talking to at the moment probably has more real power than Nikasar himself. Really? Gurgay looked at Zah. Yes, that's Heyman, rector of Kansev College, a Nikasar's mentor. You don't mean he tells the Emperor what to do? Not officially, but... Zah belched. Nikasar was brought up in the college, spent 60 years, child and apex, learning the game from Haman. Haman raised him, groomed him, taught him all he knew about the game and everything else. So, when old Molsk gets his one-way ticket to the land of Nod, not before time, and Nikasar takes over, who's the first person he's going to turn to for advice? I see, Gurgay nodded. He was starting to regret not having studied more on Azad the political system rather than just Azad the game. I thought the colleges just taught people how to play. That's all they do in theory, but in fact, they're more like surrogate noble families. Where the Empire gains over the usual bloodline setup is they use the game to recruit the cleverest, most ruthless, and manipulative apices from the whole population to run the show rather than have to marry new blood into some stagnant aristocracy and hope for the best when the genes shake out. Actually, quite a neat system. The game solves a lot. I can see it lasting. Contact seems to think it's all going to fall apart at the seams one day, but I doubt it myself. This lot could outlast us. They are impressive, don't you think? Come on, you have to admit you're impressed, aren't you? Unspeakably. Gurgay said, but I'd like to see more before I come to any final judgment. You'll end up impressed. You'll appreciate its savage beauty. No, I'm serious. You will. You'll probably end up wanting to stay. Oh, and don't pay any attention to that dingbat drone they've sent to nurse mage you. 
They're all the same, those machines. Want everything to be like the culture. Peace and love and all that same bland crap. They haven't got the... Zaw belched. The sensuality to appreciate the... He belched again. Empire. Believe me. Ignore the machine. Gourguet was wondering what to say to that when a brightly dressed group of apices and females came up to surround him and Shehobaham Zaw. An apex stepped out of the smiling, shining group, and, with a bow Gourguet thought looked exaggerated, said to Zaw, Would our esteemed envoy amuse our wives with his eyes? I'd be delighted, Zaw said. He handed the sweetmeat tray to Gourguet, and while the women giggled and the apices smirked at each other, he went close to the females and flicked the nictitating membranes in his eyes up and down. There, he laughed, dancing back. One of the apices thanked him. Then the group of people walked away, talking and laughing. They're like big kids, Zaw told Gourguet, then patted him on the shoulder and wandered off, a vacant look in his eyes. Flair Imzaho floated over, making a noise like rustling paper. I heard what that asshole said about ignoring machines, it said. Hmm, Gourguet said. I said, oh, it doesn't matter. Not feeling left out because you can't dance, are you? No, I don't enjoy dancing. Just as well. It would be socially demeaning for anybody here even to touch you. What a way with words you have, machine, Gourguet said. He put the plate of savories in front of the drone and then let go and walked off. Flair Imsaho yelped and just managed to grab the falling plate before all the paper-wrapped pastries fell off. Oh, fine, we'll do another couple pages. <laughs> Gourguet wandered around for a while, feeling a little angry and more than a little uncomfortable. He was consumed with the idea that he was surrounded by people who were in some way failed, as though they were all the unpassed components from some high-quality system which would have been polluted by their inclusion. Not only did those around him strike him as foolish and boorish, but he also felt that he was not much different himself. Everybody he met seemed to feel he'd come here just to make a fool of himself. Contact sent him out here with a geriatric warship, hardly worthy of the name, gave him a vain, hopelessly gauche young drone, forgot to tell him things which they ought to have known would make a considerable difference to the way the game was played, the college system, which the limiting factor had glossed over, was a good example, and put him at least partly in the charge of a drunken, loudmouth, fool childishly infatuated with a few imperialist tricks and a resourcefully inhumane social system. During the journey here, the whole adventure had seemed so romantic, a great and brave commitment, a noble thing to do. That sense of the epic had left him now. All he felt at this moment was that he, like Shehoba Hamza or Flair Imzaho, was just another social misfit, and this whole spectacularly seedy empire had been thrown to him like a scrap. Somewhere, he was sure, minds were loafing in hyperspace within the field fabric of some great ship, laughing. He looked about the ballroom. Reedy music sounded. The paired apices and luxuriously dressed females moved about the shining marquetry floor in preset arrangements, their looks of pride and humility equally distasteful, while the servant males moved carefully around like machines, making sure each glass was kept full, each plate covered. He hardly thought it mattered what their social system was. It simply looked so crassly, rigidly over-organized. Ah, Gurgi, Pickwell said. He came through the space between a large potted plant and a marble pillar, holding a young-looking female by one elbow. There you are. Gurgi, please meet Trainev Dutley's daughter. The apex smiled from the girl to the man and guided her forward. She bowed slowly. Trainev is a game player too, Pickwell told Gurgay. Isn't that interesting? I'm honored to meet you, young lady, Gurgay said to the girl, bowing a little too. She stood still in front of him, her gaze directed at the floor. Her dress was less ornate than most of those he'd seen, and the woman inside it looked less glamorous. Well, I'll leave you two odd ones out to talk, shall I? Pickwell said, taking a step back, 
hands clasped. And Miss Dutley's daughter's father is over by the rear bandstand, Gurgi, if you wouldn't mind returning the young lady when you've finished talking. Gurgay watched Pickwell go, then smiled at the top of the young woman's head. He cleared his throat. The girl remained silent. Gurgay said, I, uh, I'd thought that only intermediates, apices, played Azad. The girl looked up as far as his chest. No, sir. There are some capable female players, of minor rank, of course. She had a soft, tired-sounding voice. She still did not raise her face to him, so he had to address the crown of her head, where he could see the white scalp through the black, tied hair. Ah, he said. I thought it might have been forbidden. I'm glad it isn't. Do males play too? They do, sir. Nobody is forbidden to play. That is embodied in the Constitution. It is simply made... It is only that it is more difficult for either... The woman broke off and brought her head up with a sudden, startling look. For either of the lesser sexes to learn, because all the great colleges must take only apex scholars. She looked back down again. Of course, this is to prevent the distraction of those who study. Gourguet wasn't sure what to say. I see, was all he could come up with at first. Do you hope to do well in the games? If I can do well, if I can reach the second game in the main series, then I hope to be able to join the civil service and travel. Well, I hope you succeed. Thank you. Unfortunately, it is not very likely. The first game, as you know, is played by groups of ten, and to be the only woman playing nine apices is to be regarded as a nuisance. One is usually put out of the game first, to clear the field. Hmm, I was warned something similar might happen to me, Gurgay said, smiling at the woman's head and wishing she would look up at him again. Oh, no. The woman did look up then, and Gurgay found the directness of her flat-faced gaze oddly disconcerting. They won't do that to you. It wouldn't be polite. They don't know how weak or strong you are. They... She looked down again. They know that I am, so it is no disrespect to remove me from the board so that they may get on with the game. Gurgay looked round the huge, noisy, crowded ballroom where the people talked and danced and the music sounded loud. Is there nothing you can do? He asked. Wouldn't it be possible to arrange that ten women play each other in the first round? She was still looking down, but something about the curve of her cheek told him she might have been smiling. Indeed, sir. But I believe there has never been an occasion in the Great Game series when two lesser sexes have played in the same group. The draw has never worked out that way, in all these years. Ah, Gurgay said, and single games, one against one. They do not count unless one has gone through the earlier rounds. When I do practice single games, I am told that I'm very lucky. I suppose I must be. But then I know I am, for my father has chosen me a fine master and husband, and even if I do not succeed in the game, I shall marry well. What more can a woman ask for, sir? Gurgay didn't know what to say. There was a strange, tingling feeling at the back of his neck. He cleared his throat a couple of times. In the end, all he could find to say was, I hope you do win. I really hope you do. The woman looked briefly up at him, then down again. She shook her head. After a while, Gurgay suggested that he take her back to her father, and she assented. She said one more thing. They were walking down the great hall, threading their way through the clumps of people to where her father waited, and at one point they passed between a great carved pillar and a wall of battle murals. During the instant they were quite hidden from the rest of the room, the woman reached out one hand and touched him on the top of his wrist. 
With the other hand, she pressed a finger over, over a particular point on the shoulder of his robe, and with that one finger pressing and the others lightly brushing his arm, in the same moment whispered, You win! You win! Then they were with her father, and after repeating how welcome he felt, Gourguet left the family group. The woman didn't look at him again. He had had no time to reply to her. Are you all right, Jernau Gourguet? Blair Imzaho said, finding the man leaning against a wall and seemingly just staring into space, as though he was one of the liveried male servants. Gourguet looked at the drone. He put his finger to the point on the robe's shoulder the girl had pressed. Is this where the bug is on this thing? Yes, the machine said. That's right. Did Chehoba Hamza tell you that? Hmm, I thought so, Gurgay said. He pushed himself away from the wall. Would it be polite to leave now? Now? The drone started back a little, humming loudly. Well, I suppose so. Are you sure you're all right? Never felt better. Let's go. Gourguet walked away. You seem agitated. Are you really all right? Aren't you enjoying yourself? What did Zaw give you to drink? Are you nervous about the game? Has Zaw said something? Is it because nobody will touch you? Gourguet walked through the people, ignoring the humming, crackling drone at his shoulder. As they left the great ballroom, he realized that apart from remembering that she was called somebody's daughter, he had forgotten the woman's name. All right, I think we'll stop there. I believe the next section involves his first actual game, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for hanging out today. Um, started off a little rocky there. I just like wasn't in the mood. I don't know. Got into it halfway through though, so always feels good to get back into the characters and the story. Um. But anyway, yeah, thanks for bearing with me. Sorry I missed last week. Uh, just, you know, random mental health stuff. Just winter time, seasonal garbage. Uh, just for some reason didn't have the oomph to read. But hey, we're back at it. Um, approaching spring, <laughs> I guess, slowly. So whatever, we'll do the best we can. Uh, in the meantime, uh, right, go more. I'm glad you made it. Thanks for listening in. I appreciate it. And um, if you're listening on YouTube, then thanks for that as well. Feel free to send me an email and uh, let me know if you have any feedback. Um, you know, again, I know that the player of games is not in the same vein as what we've been reading up until now. And uh, it's getting uh, by far fewer views than, say, Wizard of Earthsea or Kugel. Uh, I don't mind that myself personally. I enjoy the book. But if uh, others are not particularly enjoying it, then please feel free to let me know. <laughs> Um, and we can adjust. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to keep going. I would say we're probably about halfway through the book. Um, yep, just took a look. Halfway through. Almost on the dot. Um, and then after that, I'll go back to Ursula K. Le Guin with The Farthest Shore. And then on to Kugel Saga. Um, anyway, I'll catch you folks next week. Uh, maybe later this week if I'm feeling it. And uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out. And I'll see you next time. Have a good one.